Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on Proposition 64, presented by Denise Bizzano and Kate Cook. This is our fifth installment of a six-part series. We hope you join us for our next webinar on February 1st. A couple of housekeeping items. First, all of your telephone lines are muted. If you'd like to ask a question, you should have a Q&A box at the top of your screen. Please type your question in this box. Um, please keep in mind that we have quite a few folks registered for today, so if Denise and Kate do not get to your questions, they will follow up after the webinar by phone or email. We are also offering CLE credit for this webinar. If you check the box on your registration form to receive credit, we will email a form to you later next week. We will also email the slides to all attendees. Now to introduce today's speakers, Denise Bazzano and Kate Cook. Denise Bazzano is a member of the Municipal and Special District Law Practice Group, where she assists public entities on a broad range of legal and regulatory matters. She, is, she has prepared and produced public records pursuant to the California Public Records Act and recently completed extensive research regarding the impact, impact and implementation of the Control, Regulate, and Tax Adult Use of, Meta, of Marijuana Act. Excuse me. Kate Cook brings considerable experience to the Municipal and Special District, Districts Law and California Public Records Act practice groups. She serves as City Attorney for the City of Plymouth and Deputy City Attorney for the City of Rancho Cordova and counsels public entity clients on issues related to Public Records Act, the Brown Act, election law, and marijuana regulations. That's all for Administrative Matters. I will now hand it over to Kate and Denise. Thanks, Thanks for joining us, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, actually. So today is the fifth this part in our six-part series, and we are going to talk today about the implications of the state um, and local local taxes under Prop 64. This is Kate Cook. Uh, I'll be doing the first couple of slides, and then I'll turn it over to Denise. And the first slide is just kind of an overview of Prop 64. If everyone's been joining us previously or just reading the news. Everyone has a, a general idea of what Prop 64 did. It legalized the possession and use of recreational marijuana um, for adults 21 and over. It legalizes cultivation of six plants for personal use. And it creates the regulatory and um, licensing structure for commercial activities. It also creates uh, state marijuana tax, an excise tax we're going to talk about, a cultivation tax, and it permits local entities to enact their own taxes. Um, it also establishes the criminal and administrative enforcement standards, including, including the um, various enforcement standards that the Board of Equalization can implement uh, related to taxes. And Prop 64 passed by 57%. Uh, that passage rate was a lot higher in some counties, um, but it, you know the the implications of that are that a lot of local municipalities are now looking at um, creating additional regulations or changing the regulations on marijuana businesses and activities within their jurisdiction, and taxes are playing a big part of that. Now, in 2015, the revenue from just the medical marijuana um, industry from the dispensaries was around 58 or 60 million dollars in California. I believe for 2016 that's expected to be about double. Um, and as we all know, a major component of Prop 64's, you know, advertisements and the arguments in favor of passage were related to the tax tax revenue that it might generate. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars and up to one billion dollars in tax revenue is what everyone was hearing. It's what the legislative analyst office in um, Sacramento has predicted. We will see how that plays out. Um, but $1 billion, it's a lot of money in tax revenue for California. It's, it's still less than 1% of the state's budget, but it's still a lot of money. So today we're going to cover, you know, how that money is going to be generated, where it's going to go, and um, then also how local jurisdictions can get in the game. Now we're going to slide three. The overview of um, 
Prop 64 taxes involves, there's three general components. There's a cultivation tax, an excise tax, and a sales and use tax, or that's just the general state sales and use tax that will apply to certain parts. Um, is everyone seeing slide three on their screen? Okay. And we're going to cover each component in the in uh, of Prop 64, starting with the excise tax, which Denise will discuss. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Denise Pagano, and I'm going to cover the excise tax, the cultivation tax, as uh, well as some other uh, regulatory powers of the board of equalization and what the Mar marijuana tax fund covers. So under the AUMA, um, there is a taxation section that adds Part 14.5, the Revenue and Tax Code, specifically Sections 34010 through 34021.5. Um, the excise tax specifically is covered under Section 34011 of the Revenue and Taxation Code. Uh, the excise tax is effective January 1st, 2018. It will be at a rate of 15%. It will be imposed on purchasers of marijuana and marijuana products, uh, even including medical marijuana. The rate will be imposed on 15% of the gross receipts of any retail sale by a dispensary or other person required to be licensed to sell marijuana or marijuana products directly to a purchaser. So that would be a dispensary or retail location or even a delivery person that is making a sale directly to a purchaser. For purposes of gross receipts, um, they are including um, the sales and use tax shall include the excise tax. So it will be the product price um, and then the excise tax and then sales tax will be taken on top of that, that amount. The uh, licensee is expected to collect the tax and remit it to the Board of Equalization. That's different from the cultivation tax, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And no marijuana product may be sold unless the excise tax is paid by the purchaser at the time of sale. So uh, in terms of enforcement, the Board of Equalization will be looking at whether or not this excise tax is paid at the point of sale. And this tax will be remitted to the Board of Equalization on a quarterly basis, similar to the cultivation tax. All right, now we're on to slide five, the cultivation tax. So the AUMA also imposes a cultivation tax on all harvested marijuana that enters the commercial market. It will also be effective January 1, 2018. This tax is, is implemented in a different way, though. It focuses on um, the flower and the leaves of the plant. So the tax rate will be $9.25 per dry weight ounce for flowers and $2.75 per dry weight ounce for leaves. The, uh, the tax applies to cultivation by a licensee. In other words, anyone who possesses a license for medical or non-medical marijuana cultivation, they will have to pay this tax. It's due after the marijuana is harvested. Um, a licensee will be responsible for paying the tax, and all marijuana that leaves a cultivation Cultivators' premises, except for the waste, shall be presumed to be sold and is thereby taxable. So if you have marijuana leaving your cultivation site for any reason, the Board of Equalization will presume that it's for sale and it's subject to the taxation rate. 
Um, the rates are may be adjusted annually by the Board of Equalization um, in order to reflect the fluctuation in the relative price of flowers to leaves. And, and after January 1, 2020, the Board of Equalization can adjust the rates uh, based on inflation changes. In the, this case, the licensee is responsible for paying the tax. That's different from the excise tax. Um, the Board of Equalization also may establish other categories of harvested marijuana or unprocessed or frozen marijuana or immature plants. So the Board of Equalization may determine that there are different categories that deserve taxation. So stay tuned. Uh, and the Board of Equalization can implement regulations that prescribe a method and manner for payment of the cultivation tax. The AUMA speaks directly to the possibility that the Board of Equalization may utilize uh, methods such as tax stamps or product baggies to, um, to confirm and track uh, products so that they know exactly what has been taxed and when. So I'm going to address one question that has come up um, related to the excise tax. Um, someone has asked for us to give a concrete example of how the excise tax would work with, um, with the sales and use tax. And Denise is going to address um, the issue of the sales and use tax not being applicable to medical sales in a moment. So put that aside. We're going to put that in a parking lot, but um, I'm going to give a, a little bit of an example. So under the revenue and taxation codes that were enacted by um, Prop 64, the excise tax is counted as part of the sales price for the purpose of the sales and use tax calculation. So um, using an example, let's say your um, gross receipts on a sale were $10. The excise tax on that would then be $1.50 because it's 15%. So the total amount would then be $11.50. That would be that $11.50 then, sales price plus the excise tax, is the amount used for the purpose of calculating the sales tax. So let's say the local sales tax is 9%. Um, that would, you know, state and local combined, that would make the final total payment by that customer $12.54. And, and there might be, you know, the, the Board of Equalization puts out notices and guidance um, memorandums, so they might have some more guidance on this as things get going with licenses for commercial cannabis. Um, but that's so, so far that's the example I've been using um, for folks, and we'll get back to the fifth slide now. Right, as Kate mentioned, the Board of Equalization does have a pretty thorough website related to marijuana, so if you have further questions about the taxes and how they, can, how they would be implemented, uh, check it out. Also, the Board of Equalization um, will require permits for taxation, and we'll get to that later, but um, that's, that's, those forms are available on their website as well. So other tax regulations, um, the AUMA um, excludes sales and use tax on retail sales of medical cannabis, medical cannabis concentrate, or edible medical cannabis products, or topical cannabis. Those products are specifically excluded from sales and use tax under the AUMA. Sales and use tax will apply to non-medical marijuana, and that can be either at the state level or local level. Um, the excise and cultivation taxes are in addition as to any other tax imposed by a city, county, or city and county. The, um, the prohibition on sales tax related to medical cannabis products is effective November 9, 2016. Um, so in other words, 
as of November 9th, there shouldn't be any sales and use tax on retail sales of medical cannabis, medical cannabis concentrates, edible medical cannabis products, or topical cannabis. Um, Kate and I were discussing this beforehand, and the general consensus is that this was an error on um, the drafters of the AUMA part on their part because um, everything else is effective January 1st, 2018, but this, this, there was no date specific for this prohibition, so we think it was an oversight. Um, and the, as Kate mentioned, the excise tax would be included in calculation for the sales and use tax. The regulatory power of the board, and by board, we're talking about Board of Equalization. Um, the Board of Equalization is the designated agency to administer and collect the taxes imposed by the AUMA, and uh, they are authorized to prescribe, adopt, enforce regulations relating to um, the administration and enforcement of taxes under the AUMA. They um, may require licensee to file a monthly report. Uh, they are also going to be requiring permits from anyone who is supposed to be paying these taxes, um, and that permit can be obtained from the Board of Equalization. In order to get the permit, you may also be required to submit some type of security, like a bond or surety, uh, to cover your liability for taxes. The Board of Equalization may conduct inspections at any place marijuana is sold, cultivated, or stored. They can also inspect anywhere evidence of activities involving tax evasion may be discovered. So even though you don't uh, cultivate in a shed on the property, there may be evidence of tax evasion in that shed. So it, theoretically, they could inspect demands to inspect that shed based on uh, language in the AUMA. There is a penalty for failing to refuse to allow inspection, and it's fairly hefty, $5,000. Uh, the marijuana may be seized if taxes are not paid. And there is also a penalty uh, for $1,000 for uh, providing a false report to the Board of Equalization. Um, there are hefty penalties for failing to pay the taxes. In addition to owing the taxes, you could be subject to a penalty of at least half of the unpaid tax amount, and you may have your license revoked. And all violations of Part 14.5, which is the marijuana tax section of the AUMA, are deemed to be misdemeanors. The AUMA creates the Marijuana Tax Fund. It will consist of all taxes, interest, penalties, and other amounts from taxes created under the AUMA and or paid to the Board of Equalization. From um, this fund, there will be a special trust fund established solely to carry out the purposes of the AUMA. It is not considered general fund money all, um, all funds deposited will be, and including interest and dividends, are um, continuously appropriated for the AUMA. So they can't be spent on anything else but uh, the AUMA. Um, funds will be used to pay first the cost of state agencies that were, um, uh, that were given the task of implementing the AUMA. And then there are specific funds that were created in the Marijuana Tax Fund that have uh, a specific number assigned to them. So first the state agencies will be paid, then these specific funds will be paid out, and then finally if there's any money left over, there will be um, creations of subtrust accounts that will be funded. The state controller disperses the funds and as I said, it will be first paid out to the state agencies, um, which include the, uh, the Bureau 
of Medical Marijuana, the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Fish and Game, State Water Resource Control Board, Department of Pesticide Regulation, and the laundry list continues. So there's a lot of state agencies that will be in line. They get to recover their reasonable costs incurred. And um, so it remains to be seen what will be left over once those state agencies are paid. But um, assuming there's enough money to go around, uh, they, the AUMA also prescribes specific uh, entities that will get specific amounts of money, including $10 million to public universities to study impact. And those impacts are, um, you know, they may include public safety issues, impacts on public health, use of marijuana rates, et cetera. So uh, the large chunk of the money will go to public universities to study uh, marijuana impacts. Then $10 million in the first year, and then $10 million every year, additionally, every year thereafter for a $50 million max um, is going to be given to the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, and they're going to administer community reinvestment grants. Um, so that those grants will be for mental health issues, job placement issues, substance abuse programs, et cetera. These grants will be issued to local health departments and at least 50% to qualified community-based nonprofits. An additional three, well, sorry, a $3 million to CHP to establish protocols to determine if a driver is impaired. This will be a big issue because as uh, marijuana is legalized, we need a surefire test to determine whether or not a driver is impaired. So I personally was happy to see that the CHP got some of the money to establish protocols and um, a procedure for testing to determine whether a driver is impaired. $2 million is specifically earmarked to go to UCSD to study marijuana as a pharmacological agent. So those are some examples of the specific funding. Whatever money is left over is going to be uh, put into the subtrust account. 60% will go to the Youth Education Prevention, Early Intervention, and Treatment subtrust account. Um, this is a um, Then 20% will go to state and local government law enforcement trust sub, subtrust account. And then an additional 20% will go to the environmental restoration and protection subtrust account. Uh, most uh, local agencies are concerned with the 20% that they could be getting uh, through grants under the uh, state and local government law enforcement subtrust account. Um, this 20% this will be split between the CHP and the Board of State and Community Corrections, who will be uh, parceling out the funds under, uh, under the 20%. CHP will be allowed to conduct training programs for detecting, testing, and enforcing laws against driving under the influence with that money, and they will also uh, fund internal CHP, pro CHP programs and grants to local governments for education, prevention, and enforcement of laws related to driving under the influence uh, for alcohol and other drugs, including marijuana. So um, it's not clear how much money will be uh, parceled out to local governments for um, these grants, so we'll see, uh, you know, we'll know in a few years how much money cities can, and local governments can expect to receive under these grants, but um, as we've mentioned before, the Board of State and Community Corrections will be um, distributing the money, and the AUMA specifically provides that they cannot make any grants to local governments which have banned the cultivation including personal outdoor cultivation or retail sale of marijuana or marijuana products. So if you if your 
city or county has banned uh, cultivation, including personal outdoor cultivation, because of course you can't prohibit indoor cultivation of six plants, um, or retail sale of marijuana or marijuana products, you won't be eligible for that 20% of whatever amount is available for these grants. Um, one thing to consider, we've discussed it a lot, and yes, that's important to pass on to your electives. They may want to consider this information in determining whether or not to allow marijuana in the community. Um, but the flip side to this is that there may be some federal grants that earmark um, compliance with federal laws, which would prohibit any marijuana in the community because, of course, we all know that marijuana is illegal under federal law. So it's something to consider, but you should also consider the, the federal implications as well. Thanks, Denise. Okay, we're going to move on now to the second half of the program and talk about local taxes. Um, Prop 64 under Revenue and Taxation Code 34021 um, essentially permits cities and counties or city and county from um, permits the, the enactment of local taxes related to marijuana. There were about 20 or so uh, marijuana taxes on the books at the beginning of 2016. That has changed dramatically in the last year. There's now, I believe, over 80. There were 63 measures alone on the ballot um, in November, 61 of which passed. So we're going to be, I'm going to be covering kind of the, the landscape of these taxes and the different approaches local um, entities take and some success stories and some um, not so success stories of um, how they're all playing out. So, as I said, there's more than 80 local taxes or you know some form of marijuana tax on the books in the in different local entities around California. That doesn't mean that they're all being implemented. Um, several, you know, several entities have put a tax on the books, but haven't quite yet. Um, permitted these uses in their jurisdiction. So they just sort of have it waiting in the wings. Um, the most popular form of a local tax is, you know, a business license, which is a business license tax or some other form of um, excise tax. These are the most common approaches to taxing marijuana. Um, as many of you may know, an, an excise tax is essentially it's a, a general class of taxes that um, a tax that is assessed on an activity that's happening in your jurisdiction. And a, and a business license tax is a type of excise tax. A uh, business license tax is, um, gets implemented on, on the business, um, but an excise tax can be, you know, can be implemented on the business or on the purchaser. Most cities um, or counties have gone with the business license or excise tax approach and the percentage on gross receipts is a is a popular one. <clears throat> For example, it'll the tax will be up to ten percent of gross receipts um, or up you know from seven to ten percent on gross receipts of marijuana businesses. That administratively might be a little bit easier to implement. Um, and, and these taxes, you know, can be imposed for revenue purposes. Um, and as Denise mentioned earlier, the AUMA does prohibit sales and use taxes on the retail sales of medical marijuana. So in general, the business license tax or excise tax is kind of the way everyone's going. There are some other approaches. Um, some cities have gone with a square footage approach. Um, for example, I think Desert Hot Springs does it this way. Um, Monterey County recently passed um, a tax, and that one has a few different approaches. They do $25 per square foot for cultivation operations, $5 per square foot for nurseries, 
And then for other marijuana businesses, they implemented a 10% tax on gross receipts. Um, we have heard from some industry folks that the square footage approach is not favorable to them because it can really impact how they set up their business. Um, you know, does that square footage mean just the square footage where the marijuana is being grown? Um, does it count if you're stacking it on top of each other? What happens if a crop fails and you're unable to sell that crop? Do you still get taxed on it? So there can be some complications with administering that. And it also, um, in terms of, you know, your staff time within a local jurisdiction that is needed to perhaps run audits and, you know, make sure that you're collecting the amount you're allowed to collect might make it a bit more complicated or um, time intensive <coughs> to ensure that you're getting what you need from those square footage amounts. Um, it also, if you're doing it that way, that might certainly be reason to have a higher um, permit fee in your jurisdiction because it's going to take more time to make sure that tax is being implemented correctly. And also business license, um, you know, taxes do allow for criminal penalties in the form of fines and fees that if they're not paid. Um, just one more thing to note. Um, something to consider, though, with all these, you know, taxes, Denise just went over all of the state taxes. We've got the 15% state excise tax, um, anywhere from the state's, you know, seven and a half up to some local taxes of 10%. You've got the lo you know, state and local sales and use tax, the cultivation tax. So all of this could add up to a cumulative tax rate on marijuana, at least recreational marijuana, of up to 35%. Uh, the industry has been pretty vocal about this being perhaps a problem. So cities and counties that are looking to you know, use this as a cash cow for revenue um, are being advised to, you know, to really be careful because for a few reasons, you know, it will affect competition. If, if, if your local entity is trying to attract some of these businesses to generate revenue, but you have a 15% tax rate or even a 10% tax rate, but the neighboring jurisdiction only has a 5% tax rate, um, you may find you're not attracting the businesses that you want to attract. Additionally, there's um, general consensus that if the tax rates are too high, it will simply you know, stimulate the illicit market or allow it to continue because folks won't want to join the legitimate um, marijuana world if they're going to be have to, having to pay so much in taxes. Um, many cities and counties that have passed taxes are putting a range in their ballot language, you know, from 7 to 10%, from 2 to 10%, so that they then have the ability, or you can just put up to 10%, then there's the ability of the local jurisdiction to adjust for market conditions or adjust for competition and make sure that the tax rate that's being implemented makes the most sense and achieves all those things that the jurisdiction wants to achieve, including, you know, preventing the illicit market. So these are some cities that have, um, or perhaps don't have, <laughs> there's one on here that doesn't have uh, marijuana taxes. Um, and I'll use that Costa Mesa as an example of one that did not pass in recently. Sacramento has a tax rate of about 4%. Um, Sacramento attempted to pass a special tax this past election um, cycle, but it did not it did not get approved. So their general tax of four percent on these businesses is still in place. It raises about three million dollars um, in revenue from about I think twenty five to thirty dispensaries in the city. Um, in Davis, California, they have passed an up to a ten percent of gross receipts tax on recreational only. Um, San Diego is also one that passed for recreational only. That's a 5 to 15% tax range. Santa Cruz 
has a, a tax rate of 7 to 10 percent. San Leandro is up to 10 percent. Cloverdale is up to 10 percent. Uh, Mendocino County uh, has passed one up to 10 percent. Um, in Oakland, that uh, most folks know, is the first city in the state to um, tax and regulate medical marijuana. They've got a 5 percent tax for medical marijuana on the books, and they also have a 10% tax that's been on the books for quite a while for recreational marijuana. Um, the, the largest one I've seen is Santa Barbara passed one that allows the city to do up to 20% um, for their tax rate. Does, that doesn't mean they'll implement that, but you never know. <laughs> and there was quite a lot of a, um, objection to that from the industry. And in terms of what kind of revenues come from this, um, you know, an example of the so Harborside, which is the largest, last I checked, was the largest uh, medical marijuana dispensary in California, and I think perhaps in the country, you know, in Oakland with that 5% tax rate, they just that dispensary alone brings in about 1.5 million dollars in tax revenue for the city. Um, what we've heard more commonly for a dispensary is a city can expect anywhere from you know even small cities can expect anywhere from 70 to 125 thousand dollars a year on a five or seven percent tax um, in revenue. It is um, from conversations I've had with some city finance folks, um, a lot of these businesses are run by folks who are new to the business world, who are new to um, keeping books and all of that. So it can be a bit of an administrative task to stay on top of it or conduct audits if the, you know, you don't have to, to do the audit, but if the city or county wants to do an audit to ensure it's collecting all the taxes it's owed, it, it can be quite a bit of work. So it's advisable that, you know, your business license fee or the special use permit that fee that goes along with a marijuana business, that it that you really study that cost that your city staff or county staff is going to have to, you know, the time spent to, to implement everything related to um, to overseeing those businesses and enforcing any local tax make sure that that fee provides enough um, for the jurisdiction to cover its reasonable, recover its reasonable costs related to, you know, implementing all of the local laws and regs. And Costa Mesa was um, an example of somewhere where they put um, a measure on the ballot that included both a tax and um, the ability to bring to allow dispensaries for the city. I think there was two competing measures on the ballot. One was an initiative, and one was from the city. And it, there was a bit of a political issue with everything that went down. But I believe both of them failed. So some cities are finding if if they want to do a tax to raise revenue, that the more successful approach is just to keep the tax by itself. Don't tie anything related to land use or businesses um, that would be allowed or not allowed to the tax. That way you kind of can keep those issues separately. Um, and you don't have to, you know, in many places the legislative um, body can make the rules on land use without going to the voters. So there's not always necessarily a reason to ask the voters if you want to allow dispensaries or businesses in town. You might as well just keep the tax. Um, question isolated. Some cities also did sort of the A plus B measure approach where they put a general tax on related to marijuana on the ballot and then they had an advisory measure that accompanied, accompanied it, sort of asking voters, hey, if we pass this, do you want us to spend it like this? And um, As most folks know, that's not binding on the jurisdiction, but it just can create some you know, guidance and assurance for voters sometimes that you're going to spend this money on law enforcement or you know, nuisance abatements and therefore I'll, I'll support your tax. Um, another approach that um, has been done in the city of Cloverdale, um, we worked with that city on their Measure P this uh, last election cycle. 
which passed by a very high percentage, I think at least 75 or 76 percent. And that tax on marijuana businesses has language in there that allows for a range um, or a varying rate depending on the business activity type. So that could give the council the freedom to have a lower tax on a medical dispensary or no tax on a nonprofit dispensary, but a higher tax on a, a for-profit marijuana business. So getting a tax on the ballot. These taxes, you know, have been, for the most part, quite successful in the state, but some have not been successful. The, for the most part, most cities are going with the, cities or counties are going with a general tax approach, and a general tax is, essentially allows the jurisdiction to spend the money on anything that is a legitimate government purpose. Um, just like any other tax that would go on the ballot, uh, the city or county needs to comply with state law, with Prop 218, with Prop 62, and the legislative body, you know, puts the the tax question on the ballot by ordinance or resolution. Within that ordinance or resolution, you must state the type and method of collection, the type of tax you're going to implement, the method by which it will be collected, and the rate. Um, if you're going for a general tax, um, you need two-thirds approval by the legislative body to place that tax on the ballot. But if you're a charter city, check the charter because Sometimes the charter will have a lesser vote required to get a general tax on the ballot. <clears throat> uh, not all that common, but it, it does exist, so it may be a lesser amount, and that would trump the two-thirds required. So with the general tax, after two-thirds of the legislative body um, votes to place it on the ballot, then majority voter is appro uh, approval is required to pass it. And general taxes need to go on the ballot when there's a regular uh, local election happening. So that generally means when when your legislative body has seats up for election and there's a regular municipal election or regular county election, that's when you can put that general tax on the ballot. You may do it in, um, <laughs> you may do it um, on a different ballot, but in order to do that, the, the legislative body would have to have um, a unanimous emergency declaration that the tax is needed and needs to go on the ballot. Um, could you do that with a marijuana tax? Certainly, if your city was or county was in um, financial trouble, um, generally to do that, you need to show that it's important, um, you know, that it's a significant threat to public health and safety if you don't have this tax. This situation was unexpected, it's imminent, it's going to happen no matter what, um, and you've got to have you know, relevant persuasive facts supporting that emergency declaration to put the matter on the ballot in, in a non-regular election. So that's just for a general tax. If, if a city or county is going for a special tax, um, majority approval by the legislative body is required to get it on the ballot, and then two-thirds of the voter approval is required. I mean, as I mentioned, a few of those have not passed recently. Sacramento tried to do one of those that didn't pass. I think Colfax was another city that attempted a special tax for marijuana, and that didn't pass. So ballot language. There's all kinds of options for the ballot language, but there are a few requirements. Um, you must state the tax rate and the duration of the tax. Um, there's also a new requirement um, under AB 109 that passed in 2015, and it amended Elections Code 13119, Subdivision B. And it's kind of up in the air whether this would apply, but most um, jurisdictions are trying to comply with it just so they you know, are safe. And that new law says that if you're going to put a tax on the ballot or propose raising a tax and putting that on the ballot, then the language of the ballot measure must state the amount of the money that's going to be raised annually by the tax. Now, that <laughs> that's pretty hard to um, comply with when 
you're taxing this, you know, new industry that might not even be within your jurisdiction yet. So um, there's some various ways that cities or counties have gone about complying with um, Elections Code 13119. Um, in San Diego, the ballot measure had language that said generating an undetermined amount of revenue, which is a pretty general statement saying, hey, we don't know how much this is going to, to bring in, but we're at least telling you, putting that information there to comply with the law. In Cloverdale, the language we put in that ballot measure said to raise an estimated revenue of $90,000 per business, and that was based on, on research that had been done. Um, you know, other cities' ballot language or county, I've seen them say, you know, to raise an estimated revenue of blank to blank, and they put a range. So to play it safe, most jurisdictions are including, in addition to the tax rate and duration, they're putting the um, what their best estimate is for how much money it would raise annually. Um, and like I've mentioned before, you can also set a tax range. You don't have to um, put an exact amount. And if you can come up with any rational basis for doing so, you can also allow for different rates for different types of activities, a different rate for cultivation, a different rate for dispensaries. If it's a special tax, um, the purpose for the revenue needs to be stated. Um, and then for the ballot language, some other considerations are, do you want to be general and just state this will apply to all marijuana-related businesses, or do you want it to apply um, to dispensaries only, to for-profit only? Do you want it to apply to medical as well as recreational? There's lots of options, and cities have gone different ways. Some of the higher, um, some of the ballot measures that have gotten the the you know, the larger, largest amount of voter approval have been those that have been for recreational only. Um, so it's, that's really a, a policy decision for the legislative body to come up, come up with, but it varies city by city. And I am also realizing that at this point, I accidentally forgot to read our disclaimer language <laughs> that we typically say at the beginning of the webinar. And so I want to let everyone know that, um, you know, the firm here we represent both public and private clients on medical and recreational marijuana issues. Our stance as a firm is neutral. We essentially just try to promote client interest. Um, and this webinar today is educational and is not necessarily intended to be legal advice. And Another thing we like to remind everyone is that marijuana is still a Schedule One substance and illegal drug under federal law. And as we all know, it's really unclear how the new administration under President-elect Trump is going to approach marijuana enforcement. Um, most cities and counties have been relying for years on the famous Cole Memo that the federal government put out several years ago that said that the feds were not going to crack down um, or prosecute uh, marijuana businesses if they're complying with state laws. And if they're, you know, they're going to focus their efforts on marijuana activities that were in danger of getting the product to into the illicit market or into the hands of minors. Um, we have no idea how the new administration is necessarily going to approach this. So it's something that local entities should keep in mind as they're setting their policy. Um, one thing that some cities are doing when they're writing their new um, ordinances that address these businesses is putting some disclaimer language in there um, and also some language that allows for permits or licenses to be revoked if the feds uh, suddenly start enforcing. So we do have a few questions that we're going to try to address quickly before we wrap up and let everybody go finish their lunch. And the first question is, would a local government be eligible for the 20% fund if it allows only delivery in its jurisdiction? Um, I don't think so, because right. that 
the revenue and taxation code that says you're not going to be eligible for that grant money says um, you won't be eligible if you prohibit retail sales. And retail sales includes dispensaries. So if you ban dispensaries in your jurisdiction, um, very likely you're not going to be eligible for that local grant money. Again, we have no idea how much money that fund's actually going to have because it's almost last on the list to be getting all of this money. Right. Yeah, so case, I, I would agree with Kate. Uh, assessment, and that specific section can be found at Tax and Revenue Code Section 34019, subsection F3, paragraph C, and it says specifically, the board shall not make any grants to local governments which have banned the cultivation, including personal cultivation under section 11362.2, subsection B3 of the Health and Safety Code or retail sale of marijuana or marijuana products pursuant to Section 26200 of the Business and Professions Code or as otherwise provided by law. And I think the intent there was to encourage um, local agencies to regulate rather than prohibit. And so this is kind of the carrot that they're dangling in front of local agencies to regulate rather than prohibit marijuana. So another question that we've gotten is the what is the difference between a special tax and a general tax? Um, great question. A general tax is a tax that raises general revenue for a city or county's general fund, and that revenue may be used for essentially any legitimate government purpose, even if the tax question says for the purpose of um, raising revenue to, you know, enforce, you know, police or improve parks or fix streets, um, you still, at the end of the day, can use that for any government purpose. A special tax, which requires, um, another difference is a general tax only requires a, a majority approval by voters in order to pass. A special tax requires a two-thirds approval by voters to, pa to pass. That's a, a pretty big difference. And another difference is a special tax is a tax that limits what the money can be spent on to the purpose stated in, in the measure. So if you're just raising revenue to support law enforcement activities related to marijuana and the money is going to be restricted in that way, um, and that's what the, the ballot measure says, then it would likely be, you know, that's really more of a special tax that needs two-thirds voter approval. And the last question is, does um, Elections Code 13119 requiring the tax rate and amount of tax, um, meaning that, you know, the revenue raised annually, does that only apply to the initiatives put on the ballot by obtaining signature rather than putting it on by the government body? No, that, that applies to any ballot measure. So... The, and I'll, I'll read that now. It says, if the proposed ordinance imposes a tax or raises the rate of a tax, the ballot shall include in the statement of the ordinance to be voted on the amount of money to be raised annually and the rate and duration of the tax to be levied. And I've seen actually in voter guides um, that counties put out a note, the folks, you know, doing the um, initiative process to try to get their own ordinance on the ballot a note about that new law, but it applies to the legislative body as well. So if, if a city or county is putting something on the ballot, it too needs to make its best effort to state that the, you know, how much it thinks um, the revenue raised by the tax will be. Not, you know, not everyone completely agrees 100% that that new language would apply to this type of tax, um, but in general, you know, better safe than sorry, and it seems like a good idea to do your best to, to estimate what the revenue would be or just say an undetermined amount like San Diego did in their ballot language. And a, a great resource for <coughs> checking out ballot language on all these measures um, is Ballotpedia. It's a website where you can 
see, you know, the details on what passed, what didn't pass, what the language said, um, what the advertisement said leading up to it. And um, another great resource that folks may know about is Michael Coleman's um, local government finance website. He puts out an annual report on local taxes and fees that were passed. And on the most recent one, I believe on page 14, he has a little assessment on the marijuana taxes that were on the ballot and which ones passed and which ones didn't. And one final reminder of if a local government is looking to put something on the ballot, um, everyone should keep in mind that you know local money, public money cannot be used to advocate for a tax measure, um, which would include a marijuana tax measure. You can put out informational um, brochures, you know, educational pieces that explain what the money would be used for, how much you think would be raised, but you have to be really careful um, and look to your city or county attorney to make sure that any materials that are put out about a tax measure that goes on the ballot doesn't advocate for it because that could easily um, not withstand a challenge by a, you know, a, a tax group that may challenge it. Just in case um, people missed it, Kate read from Elections Code Section 13119. That was about the, re the revenue that you're um, expected to generate from a tax and the requirement that that be in the ballot language. So we've got another question about um, providing a list of the cities and counties that have adopted marijuana taxes, the type of tax and the tax rate that you referenced in the webinar. Um, the, the, one of the best places, like I mentioned, to find one of those cumulative lists on who's passed what is Michael Coleman's um, website and publication. Um, additionally, um, Ballotpedia, like additionally Ballotpedia, like I mentioned. We don't have a comprehensive um, list yet that we can pass out, but that might be something that we'll be doing in the future. But if someone wants to email me, I can send you links to those uh, resources. And that is all we've got for today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone.